Good morning and welcome back to Black Bear Forge. This morning when I came up to the shop, I had a plan. And that plan was to get back to work on our and iron project using this forge welded finial that we forged down into a three quarter inch square bar. Now on projects like this, I'd like to stop and think and take a look at it, see where I am, am I happy with the results I've got so far? And unfortunately on these, I noticed that one of these has a really nice square end on it and the other one does not. And this is really not acceptable. This is off on the diamond. It's longer on this diagonal than it is this diagonal. And I saw that happening as I was forging it, tried to correct it under the power hammer, but that has its own problems because you end up putting a flat down one set of corners and not on the other set. So it starts to not match and you have to deal with that some other way. And it's still kind of diamond shaped. Since that isn't what I want in the finished project, I need to figure out a way to correct that. And I really think it's not going to be too hard to correct that. Using a V-block or a pair of V-blocks, we can put this in the V-block, top and bottom, and we can force that back into square much easier than we can trying to forge it by hand. Now, unfortunately, I don't have any V-blocks that I can use this way. I have bottom V-blocks. And I could certainly make one that is a top tool that I need a striker for. I don't have a striker available, at least not today. Sometimes I can get somebody. So that means I need to make a set of tools that are either a spring tool like this that I could use at the anvil, or I could use under the power hammer, or perhaps hydraulic press dies, or a spring tool like this could be used under the treadle hammer. And this one is not a V-tool, this is round, so it's not the right tool. I'd have to make a V-tool like this. But after going to the Rocky Mountain Smiths demo a couple of months ago and sharing some of that tooling information with you, there are a lot of requests for more fly press tooling and more information on that. So I thought, let's make tools for use under the fly press. It's a really good tool for this. It's quiet, it's controlled. It's pretty easy to see what's happening without going too far under a power hammer, hydraulic press. It's easy to get a little bit carried away. And then you got to fix what you screwed up trying to fix something else. So a fly press is a great tool for this. And this is a good opportunity to make some simple fly press tools. Now for these two, now for these V blocks, I've cut six pieces of one inch square bar. This is supposed to be one inch square. So one inch square bar gives me just the perfect die top and bottom to make this exactly what I want it to be. And the reason I've cut six, you only need two. You just need a V like this. But if you weld these up with a block in the corner, and this one it doesn't stay, it's just a, a form really, that gives you your nice V angle and keeps it at 90 degrees and you want it at 90 degrees. If you get this off somewhere, if you let it close in or open up, you're not gonna end up with a nice square bar. You're gonna be creating another problem, as I say, and you don't wanna do that. So I'll get that all lined up like that and I'll clamp it up with some vice grip clamps here. Make sure everything is nice and straight. And then I'll put my weld in here. This will be the underside and where this block is will be the top side. Now there is a risk because you're welding only on one side that this is going to distort. That's as, as your weld cools, that wants to open up. So I'm gonna leave that block clamped in there until it is completely cooled. And if possible, I'll either put my base plate or my shank for use under the treadle hammer in here before I take the clamps off, if I can do that. If not, I'll wait till the last second before I pull the clamps, and generally that works out. I've never had any problem with these that I use at the anvil. They all end up being nice square corners. So just be aware that that's an issue. Now, I don't think you need to watch me weld. Most of you are probably better welders than I am anyway, so I'm gonna go weld this up come back with this part done and then show you what I do for a base for the fly press and how the tool is going to mount into the fly press. Then I'll weld that and then we'll see if they work. Okay, so I've got those initial welds done and that means these will stay together. I've just left the clamps on to make sure they aren't too inclined to spread apart as that weld cools. Almost cool, so I'm probably okay, but no reason to take the clamps off yet. One of the key elements of a fly press tool is that it should have a shoulder. This goes into a round hole in the fly press, and we'll show you that when we actually install these finished tools. But that shoulder keeps you from upsetting this end inside that tool holder. If you upset this in there, it's really going to be hard to get back out. So having a shoulder on here 
and all the pressure and use bears on the shoulder and not on the end of the tool. Now at the Rocky Mountain Smith's demo I mentioned earlier, Scott said his technique for getting that shoulder is often to just use a bolt and a nut. And the bolt and the nut combination, if your bolt is long enough, gives you two tools. You run the nut up on here, and then you cut this apart. So you end up with two pieces. This piece, the, the head, is the shoulder, and then you weld a tool onto the end of it. They're fabricated tools. And this piece, the nut, is the shoulder, and you've got a little bit of an extension there. And that's what I will then weld into this piece to make this tool. The threaded end goes in the fly press. It doesn't matter that it's threaded. This doesn't spin. It doesn't turn. It's just locked in there. Threads aren't going to hurt anything. They don't add anything. Don't need them. It's just that they happen to be there, so I'm not going to worry about them. And if for some reason this doesn't fit, sometimes the holes on the fly presses are ever so slightly under an inch, we can just grind that off. It doesn't have to be exact. Again, it's not a rotary tool. It's stationary in use. This doesn't spin. It just goes up and down. So that's going to weld on there. And then on the other plate, on the other set, I will weld a flat plate on there. And this just sits on the bed of the fly press and gets clamped down so it doesn't have to be anything very special, just something heavy enough to weld to and not deform when you're using it. So once again, I'm going to go weld this stuff up, meet you right back here. So we have our two tools, still a little bit too hot to hold on to. And I went ahead and ground the edges here so there's not a sharp edge that might leave track marks in the finished piece. And these are now ready to install in the fly press. But I have noticed something here, that if I just install this one flat on the table, the horns on this kind of hang up, so that's not going to work. But luckily the fly press is pretty easy to, to deal with in things like this. If I just put a spacer under there, this is something that will be an axe eventually, then I have plenty of room to put that in there. I think I'll start though with this piece. Again, the threaded section doesn't thread into this. It just goes up in here like that. Don't put your fingers under here while you lower that back down. Now that's, that's not tight. I like to put this on something so there's pressure when I install it. And you notice I'm running it at 45 degrees here. That's just more convenient and allows anything long to pass b behind the or next to the fly press itself other than butting into it. Exact angle doesn't really matter. And it just has a set screw here. That's really all there is to that. And this piece, to make sure it's lined up right, I'm going to put a piece of the square bar back in there. And that guarantees that I've got a good line up there.
I kept the pieces up near a welding heat as I ran those through the fly press and that way I was reinforcing the weld and if the shearing action working on the diamond was stressing the weld any, I was less likely to shear the weld apart. Looks like everything held together fine. We are a lot more square than we were. After they cool off and before we get back to working on that project, we'll check them with a square and see how close we actually got. One of the advantages to the fly press is the tooling really is relatively easy to make as long as you have a welder. Some of these tools would be a lot harder to make if you're trying to do it entirely with forging. But by being able to weld them together and fabricate tools, it goes pretty quick, opens up a lot of doors, and it's just little bits of material like I showed you today. Lots and lots of different tools you can do this way, and we will look at more in the future. If you go back and look at that video that I linked up here, up here, in the earlier part of this video, you can see some more tools that have been done that way. In fact, we've looked at other tools here on the channel and just some general fly press stuff. And I'll try to put some more links up in that corner as the video goes on here. So hopefully you've seen some of those. And you can click on that. I think they're all still there right now if you want to watch some more of those videos. The biggest problem with this project today was that I have an engine-driven welder. That means it runs on gas. It ran out of gas, so I had to go get gas. And while I was out getting gas, I stopped at the post office. So I just told you that story so I could show you what's in this envelope that came in the mail today. And this comes from, it says Tipton. Oh, there's a note before I look at it, I'll look at the note. I hope your Christmas and New Year's were very nice and full of family, friends, and merriment. Yes, they were. I wanted to get this out before Christmas, but took on more than I could chew. I've enclosed two ornaments I forged as presents for my family. This was the first real project I undertook in my blacksmith journey. Wow, that's pretty great for you to be willing to share that with other people. I really appreciate that. Your channel has truly been an inspiration to me, and I want to say a huge heartfelt thank you. I love that you teach so much in your videos and that you do it in such a friendly way. Well, you're very welcome. I'm glad I can help. I look forward to seeing what the new year holds for your channel and growing as a smith through your projects. All the best. Well, thank you very much. I greatly appreciate that. And let's see what these ornaments are that he sent. It's a nice twisted candy cane ornament. And a little icicle ornament with a little spinner on it. That's a nice touch. I've never thought about putting a spinner like that on an ornament before, but that way it can turn around. Those will find their way onto the Christmas tree next year. Unfortunately, as you say, it is after Christmas and a little late this year, but I appreciate the thought nevertheless. I'm gonna put those away with the other ornaments as we pack up from the holiday season, and these will be very treasured next year. In fact, I may need to make a blacksmith's Christmas tree out of iron so I can hang all this kind of stuff on it right here in the shop. But anyways, I hope you did enjoy looking at how to make some simple fly press tools. You can adapt that same technique to make tools for the anvil on a spring handle or something like that. I don't know if I would use that simple of a welded tool under the power hammer or not. That might be a little abusive for it. But if you put really good welds on it and really put a good striking surface on there that holds the whole tool together, it's probably okay. It's just something I haven't tried. If we ever make these for the power hammer, we'll probably make them out of solid material and put spring handles on them, and that'll be a really good power hammer tool. It would be a good alternative. Sometimes one tool is better, sometimes another tool is better. If I had had one for the power hammer, I probably would have corrected this as we were doing the original forging, and it wouldn't have been an issue today. As always, I hope you enjoyed the video. Give it a thumbs up if you did. If you haven't done so already, I would love it if you hit that subscribe button down there. Feel free to stick around, watch a few of the other videos, share the videos with your friends, but then by all means, make time in your day to get out to your shop, make something, but stay safe, wear your safety glasses, and we'll see you for the next one.